Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday, and thank you for joining um, the Project ECHO series on cancer survivorship. So today's webinar is on immunization for cancer survivors. Um, so a uh, little quick information on the coalition. Um, the coalition in collaboration with Project ECHO is providing this series um, as an introduction to issues in cancer survivorship. So today, more than two thirds of those diagnosed with cancer are told they are expect to live at least five years after diagnosis. According to the American Cancer Society in Nevada, there are currently an estimated 120,200 cancer survivors, and in 2019, 14,810 people will be diagnosed with cancer. So the series hopes to address survivors' ongoing needs with improved outcomes and quality of life for cancer survivors. So Nevada Cancer Coalition, we are Nevada's statewide nonprofit. Um, we bring together organizations and individuals across the state um, to collaborate on all things cancer. So we provide information and education to the community and healthcare providers, including uh, we house the most comprehensive resource directory on all things cancer. Um, we develop and implement cancer prevention, early detection and survivorship interventions and programs. Um, and we work on policy surrounding cancer. So I would like to introduce you to today's presenter, Charmian Likens. Um, she is a breast cancer nurse navigator and survivorship program coordinator at Renown Institute for Cancer here in Reno, Nevada. She holds certification as a certified oncology nurse and certified breast care nurse. She completed her MPH at John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health with an emphasis in occupational and environmental health. She has traveled widely as a US Foreign Service spouse and has served as a certified occupational health specialist, registered nurse at the US Embassy in Guatemala City. And prior to that, she worked inpatient oncology at Innova, Fairfax Hospital, and Fall Church, Virginia. So without further ado, let's welcome Charmian. Good morning. Uh, and then we'll go around the group this morning and see who else we have joining us. So, Dr. Barry Cole, you want to kick us off? Sure. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Barry Cole, I'm just a retired psychiatrist uh, vacationing here in Reno, but live in Vegas. Thanks. Good to have you. And Alan? Sorry, I was on mute and typing at this. Oh, never mind. Alan <laughs> Fisk, uh, uh, te technical support for Project Echo and other uh, school medicine activities. <laughs> Thanks, Alan. Uh, Emily? Can you guys hear me? Yep. Oh, cool. Uh, so I'm Emily Cooper. I actually work with Simon and other cancer researchers. I do um, cancer research. We're having a little trouble hearing you, Emily. Sorry. Okay, no, no problem. Hi, Emily. Um, and then Karen Bedsworth. Hi there. Um, my name, well, as you said, my name is Karen Bedsworth, and I am in Henderson, Nevada. I am a two-time cancer survivor, Hodgkin's when I was 18, and breast cancer when I was 50. Uh, I'm now 62, so I'm very happy to be around, and I'm very interested to hear what type of immunizations I should be sure to get. Great, thank you. And then C.R. Becht. Oh, just lost him. Uh, then uh, Griselda. Hi, good morning. I'm Gris My name is Griselda Chapa. I'm a community health worker for Nevada Health Center in Las Vegas. Great, good to have you this morning. So we'll open it up right now, see if anybody has any uh, questions that they want to ask before we get going with the presentation for today. So if you have questions, feel free to unmute yourself or uh, write in using the chat function. So we'll wait a minute or two here to see if anybody has anything. All right, we'll get going here then. Okay. 
Well, good morning, everybody. I um, want to thank you for joining us for this. I think it's kind of an important uh, subject. I am hoping that you'll get something valuable out of today's talk. Uh, feel free to type in questions or, or let me know what kind of things you personally would like to know as we go through this. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. There it goes. Okay, so we'll talk briefly about cancer survivorship in general. We'll talk a little bit about use and timing of immunizations related to the cancer treatment, and then whether there are contraindications for vaccines, and then identifying um, patients who have gaps after cancer treatment. And I'm hopefully going to give you some resources, maybe you know about, maybe you don't, that you can find more information, more detailed information. So in terms of defining a cancer survivor, there are lots of different um, ways you can define it, but we are going to, um, in this particular talk, we're going to focus on people who are after their treatment, and that's the Memorial Sloan Kettering definition, which is people who, are, who have completed their cancer treatment. Cancer survivors are, it's a, it's a word that covers a very heterogeneous group. There are people who are um, cancer survivors that have been um, out of treatment for many, many years. This is a great graph that shows how the number of cancer survivors have been growing over the course of time. And the reason for this is it, it's multifold. For one thing, people are older now. We have an aging population and cancer is more of a, of a disease of older people. We have better screening methods, so we're catching cancer at an earlier stage. We have better curative treatments, so people are able to be cured more frequently or live longer. We have better palliative treatment, so if we can't cure people, they can stay um, in treatment for longer periods of time. And we have more women survivors, and the reason that that makes this graph go up is because the majority of cancer cases are breast, as you can see in this graph. Um, we have a, a large percentage of breast cancer survivors and prostate survivors with the rest of the primary sites uh, taking up the rest of the, of the graph there. There is a subset that's very important and that are that is people who were diagnosed with cancer as children and who are now adults. And the reason for this is that we've gotten pretty good at, at curing many kinds of childhood cancer. Uh, we are approaching, 80 to 90 percent cure rate for many kinds of cancers, but not all. And the thing is that these these children have been providing data for the last 25 years through this cancer survivor study, where they've compared the health of cancer survivors, people who were diagnosed as children, with the health of their siblings. And they're finding out that the survivors of pediatric cancers do have um, very defined late effects, depending on what kind of treatment they got. And um, the, they also are finding that they may have different late effects than those who were treated as adults for on, adult onset cancer. I put this in there just to give you a visual. Um, this is a survivorship care plan. So if you are a provider and you're caring for cancer survivors, this is a very good source of information about what kind of cancer the patient had when they were diagnosed, what kind of modalities did they have for their treatment? And cancer centers are trying to provide these to patients. It's a best practice in cancer care, but not all patients do receive one. If you have a patient who's been treated, you can ask. And if you are a patient who's been treated and you haven't received one, ask your cancer provider for uh, this little written document. It's sort of an executive summary of what kind of treatment the patient actually got. So I'm gonna talk briefly about different kinds of late and long-term effects when the cancer treatment is finished. Long-term effects are ones that were caused by the cancer or its treatment, and these are effects that started while a treatment was happening, and they're continuing on. And then we compare that to late effects, which are effects that might show up after the treatment is completed, and it's sometimes separated from that treatment by many years or even decades. And so what, do you, what can you expect? It really 
is as individual as the patient because it depends on the primary site of the cancer, the stage upon which they were diagnosed, what kind of treatment modalities did they get. So cancer is treated with surgery, with chemotherapy, with radiation therapy, with immunotherapy, or just some of those, or all of those, or none of those. And so it all makes a difference as to what their survivorship experience is going to be like. The time since treatment also makes a difference because some effects are more common at the beginning, right after treatment is done, and some are not likely to be seen for a long time after treatment is done. And then underlying comorbidities can magnify or mask other uh, late effects that people might have. So some examples of late long-term effects, if the modality is surgery, really it does depend on the body type, but in general, you can have functional limitations depending on what part of the body was operated on. Um, you can have decreased range of motion, phantom pain or neuropathic pain, vitamin deficiencies for those who had surgery, uh, for example, in their small bowel or lar large bowel as well. Um, there are body image issues, sexual dysfunction issues, and a splenia I put in there because yes, sometimes the surgery requires the spleen to be taken out, but there can also be a situation where you have functional asplenia related to the treatment, and we'll talk about that as it relates to vaccines in a few minutes. Here are some examples of some late long-term effects that are, are um, associated with chemotherapy. There are many, many different kinds of drugs that um, we use to treat cancer, and depending on the different class or the combination or the schedule, people might have different risks for late effects. And does it mean that everybody who is exposed to these drugs get these late effects? No, um, but it does mean that they may be at risk and the risk may change over the course of time. For example, the anthracycline antibiotic class of chemotherapy drugs is well known for uh, causing a potential cardiomyopathy, um, which oftentimes doesn't show up for many years after treatment. So what that means is if you have a survivor who was treated with one of these drugs, doxorubicin, um, AKA the red devil, you, and you, they present to your clinic with shortness of breath and um, you think, well, maybe this is a respiratory thing. You should also be maybe in the back of your mind thinking, could it be cardiac related and maybe do a workup uh, regarding that. The heavy metal class um, is known for the neuropathy issues. Alkylating agents are well known for secondary cancers. Leomycin is, uh, is known for lung toxicity. So if you have a young, a person who was treated maybe in their teens or early 20s for um, lymphoma and they receive pleomycin and they want to go scuba diving, maybe a PFT wouldn't be a bad idea. Um, before they go to make sure that their lung functions are uh, adequate. The vinca alkaloids, again, the neuropathy, um, anti-metabolites can cause hepatotoxicity, which can show up as um, increased liver function tests um, down the road, cognitive problems as well, especially in those um, survivors of childhood cancer. So the atopicide, tenopicide, secondary cancers are always a concern. The glucocorticoids, which are not technically a chemotherapy, but are used sometimes as an anti-cancer class of drugs, have all kinds of late effects. And this is just a very small number of the many effects that they can have. And then the nitrogen must, mustards, again, you want to think in terms of the, the lung function. Um, for radiation, Radiation, really, the late effects depend on the part of the body that received the radiation. And again, when, going back to the survivorship care plan, it will be on there, or if you have the records from the uh, radiation doctor, you'll have a better idea of what part of the body was irradiated. Um, and a lot of this, the late effects have to do... Oh, is there a question? No. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> um, so a lot of the, the late effects, if you know where the radiation was done, you have a better idea of, of what kind of late effects you might expect. Um, for example, if you get radiation in the head and neck area, you might want to be thinking about what's going on with the thyroid and checking the thyroid. 
uh, function and those kind of things. But going down again, if they're getting radiation in that abdomen area and the spleen is in the radiation field, that might make a difference in how they might respond to vaccines. And if you go to astro.org, they have wonderful, wonderful um, information about radiation and late effects related to different types of radiation. Immunotherapy is sort of the new kid on the block. Uh, back in 1891, they had Coley's toxins, which um, then they found that if you injected people with a bacteria, they they actually had a remission or a reduced size of their tumor, but it never really got going in terms of a therapy until fairly recently. And we don't know a whole lot about the late effects of immunotherapy. I do want to just point out that you might hear the word cancer vaccines. And cancer vaccines have two different meanings. One is a vaccine to help you prevent cancer, and that would be the HPV vaccine. But there's also vaccines that are actually a kind of treatment, which harnesses the immune system's power to destroy non-self cells. Um, they're not first-line treatments. And so the side effects of immunotherapy have to do with the immune system itself. So unlike traditional chemotherapy, which works by killing off cells during their dividing phase, immunotherapy actually ramps up the immune system, teaches it to go after cancer cells and kill them. And so the side effects are related to a, a ramped up immune response. So um, things such as colitis, diarrhea, dermatitis, problems with uh, en your endocrine system, liver, lungs, um, occasionally eyes and joints. Um, and just if you see those patients who are on immunotherapy, it's, it's really important to differentiate if the patient says I'm being treated for cancer, making sure that you differentiate between chemotherapy, which is cytotoxic, and immunotherapy, which ramps up the immune system because the treatment for a toxicity would differ. Uh, so there was a question that came in. Yes. How much does the dose of radiation and methods of administration matter? I used to think about RADS and the device used to deliver it. Is that still relevant? It is relevant, but it's more relevant in terms of the short-term effects. Uh, the total dose can be given all at once or can be broken down into fractions. And those fractions help your body tolerate it um, so that you can get a higher dose. So, if, so a very high dose given all at once is very toxic. It's like taking a whole bottle of Tylenol all at once, very toxic. So if you break it down into smaller doses and give it over the course of time, then the acute effects are, um, are lessened. But the long-term effects, I think, have more to do with that total dose. So, um, so if you're talking short-term, yes, the amount that you get in each fraction matters. Over the long-term, it's the total dose and the area that it was um, it was given are the most important parts. I hope that answered your question. Uh, okay, so I do want to just touch basically on base very quickly on the late and long term effects uh, related to supportive care. So when we give cancer treatment, if your treatment includes chemotherapy, it will kill rapidly dividing cells, and that includes the cells in the bone marrow. And if you have a, enough of it, or if you're accept, exceptionally um, susceptible to that drug, you may end up having to get red blood cell transfusions over the course of time to replace the cells that aren't being made because the stem cells in the bone marrow were, uh, were wiped out for a period of time. Well, if you get a lot of these transfusions, you end up getting a lot of iron built up into your body because your body's not made to excrete that iron. So um, oftentimes it isn't tracked, oftentimes it's not known how, many, um, how much iron is in a, a given patient. But um, it's not a bad idea if they've had at least eight units of red blood cells to check their serum ferritin to see whether um, they do have an elevated ferritin because if it's extremely elevated it can cause damage to your organs and the treatment would be either phlebotomy if they're no longer de dependent on transfusions or collation which means taking the 
um, iron out by uh, means of using a drug, which has uh, you know side effects as well. So that would be a conversation to have. Also, patients are often treated with um, broad spectrum antibiotics due to septic episodes. When your immune system is brought down low and you have um, minimal uh, ways of fighting off infections, you're, um, you might be having fevers, they treat you uh, with these antibiotics, and that can change the gut flora, the dental flora, the, um, the lining of the GI tract can get damaged, which can allow um, the flora that resides in your GI tract to get into the bloodstream. Um, and that might be related to subsequent problems with, um, with absorption or keeping your weight on or even obesity. And because these patients have been exposed to all these different antibiotics, some of them, they may have a higher susceptibility to a multi-drug resistant organism. Um, one uh, comment that Karen shared, as a personal anecdote, having been treated with cobalt radiation in 1975, I had breast cancer as a secondary cancer directly related to radiation therapy. And I have radiation-induced pulmonary fibrosis as well as cardiovascular issues. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry to hear it. It's not entirely uncommon for those things to happen. And, um, Okay, so let's talk about vaccines. So cancer connects up with immunity in lots of different ways. So it's a little bit of a complicated, uh, complicated situation. Uh, I don't claim to know all the answers, but I, wanna, I, I really wanted to kind of address um, two things. One would be um, vaccine hesitancy in survivors and also vaccine hesitancy in providers and talk about when it's good to get vaccines for cancer patients and when you really need to hold off. And that's kind of what the focus is going to be. Um, so the, the, the thing to kind of keep in mind is the communication with the oncologist, especially if it's been very recently since that cancer diagnosis and treatment. If it's been a number of years and they're no longer being followed by the oncologist and they don't have other issues, if you don't have other issues, then, um, then probably the oncologist isn't the, the person to talk to, then you would be treating this person based on the way they're presenting that day. So this is where kind of the complications come in. You have to think about what is the immune status of the patient? What kind of treatment did they get? Where in the treatment regimen is the patient? Are they done or are they still ongoing? And what kind of thing is ongoing? So if, for example, you had surgery and radiation for breast cancer, but you're on long-term hormone blocker, um, we, you know, is it okay to get your vaccine two years into that, for example? Um, also, um, the immune system part, it, it decreases most during the beginning part of a cancer regimen. Um, and it does tend to recover after that's done within three months, but it varies by person. And also if a person has received blood products recently, that can affect their response to vaccines as well. So we re-immunize for people who get uh, stem cell transplants a lot of times, and that is driven by the transplant center, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, for other hematologic malignancies, we may not need to re-immunize. We can check titers. Um, the responses to the vaccines are more affected by the immune suppression than the booster responses. And then we talked a little bit about the asplenia. Uh, and functional asplenia. And this is important because people who either don't have a spleen or their spleen's function has been impaired by radiation treatment or the medications they're on, they do have an increased susceptibility to encapsulated organisms, which includes um, the pneumococcal bacteria, for example, um, meningococcal bacteria, and um, as well as some other um, organisms such as the Babesia species and some gut 
uh, pathogens. Uh, well, okay. Oh. All right. It's bolding. It's bolding everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Here we are. Okay, so a good resource is the CDC Pink Book for vaccination principles. They don't go into great detail in the Pink Book about cancer survivors specifically. So um, I did draw the information on the upcoming slides from other sources, but I did want to touch on these immunization principles from the Pink Book just because it's, it's important in terms of trying to get the perspective of your the survivor that you're thinking about and what kind of um, vaccines are right for them. So there's, there's different kinds of immunity. There's passive immunity and active immunity. Passive immunity is when you get antibodies from someone else, and it can be a baby getting antibodies from their mother's milk or for adults or you know, older children, it would be if you are um, administering IVIG or um, immune immune globulin like for hepatitis A. Active immunity is where vaccines come in and there's two different types of active immunity. Oh, I wanted to go back to passive immunity for a moment and just mention that passive immunity also includes your inborn uh, protections against infection and that includes like the lining of your GI tract and so that lining is actually protective. It's got cells, it's got layers and it protects you against uh, organisms from the outside getting inside to your body. And if that's impaired, like from chemotherapy or radiation therapy or the tumor itself, then and, and, um, antigens and things can get inside to your body. Um, so passive immunity has to do with that as well. But going back to active immunity, there's humoral and cellular. The humoral is the B cells, which makes antibodies. The cellular is the T cells, which work together to um, boost the effectiveness of the, of the antibodies, and um, that's where the vaccines come in. So we have vaccines that um, can cause an antibody response. We give one dose, it increases your IgMs, we give boosters, it increases the IgGs, and that's what provides the protection to you um, from these vaccines. And it can be made from live viruses or bacteria, or inactivated viruses or bacteria or parts of organisms, or it could be made in a lab using yeasts or viruses, and it's only a sub part of, it's like an antigen part. It's just a small part of the, um, of the bacteria or virus. So NCCN, which is the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, it's a group of 27 of the largest um, cancer centers in the United States, they create these guidelines and they're, they, they update them frequently, but this is the most recent guideline and their recommendation is that for all cancer and transplant survivors, consider and encourage inactivated vaccines. Inactivated vaccines are safe for people even during treatment. Vaccines that are made of purified antigens, vaccines that are made of bacterial components, or the genetically engineered recombinant antigens. So these are vaccines that are made by either germs that have been killed so that they can't do anything, or parts of germs that can't cause disease because they aren't the whole germ. And they specifically say, in the absence of known harm, Administration of inactivated vaccines with the hope of achieving some protection may be worthwhile. The usual doses and schedules are recommended. And I think this is where people sometimes get a little bit confused in that they, um, they understand that people's immunity goes down during treatment, but it doesn't mean that they, there won't be a benefit to getting an inactivated vaccine. It may not be as much of a benefit as it would be if the immune system was fully up and running, but um, you may actually get protection against a disease that otherwise could be very serious. So again, according to the NCCN, the ideal situation, and we know the world is an ideal, but in the ideal world, 
all vaccines would be given two or more weeks prior to starting treatment and any live vaccines four or more weeks prior to treatment. But that doesn't usually happen because if you've been diagnosed with cancer, you're not gonna wait four weeks to start treatment a lot of times. You're going to start treatment and worry about the vaccines down the road. So in the real world, what you really need is recovery of your neutrophils and your lymphocytes for a proper response to the vaccine. Your baseline white blood cell count has to be adequate. If you are immunocompromised and you get a vaccine, you're probably not gonna mount much of a response to it. And any ongoing infection shouldn't be present, of course. And this is an important part here is that if you're on, if you were treated with immune suppressants, for example, after a transplant, a, a stem cell transplant, you have to be off of those immune suppressants. And they, the, um, definition that the NCCN gives is less than half a milligram per kilogram of prednisone or equivalent, or if you're getting two immunosuppressants given concurrently, like cyclosporin and Prograf given together. You have to be off of that um, for, I believe, uh, six months. Okay, so here, here, here's the guidelines. So for the inactivated or the recombinant, Two weeks before treatment starts, that would be great, but more likely it'll be three months or more after cancer chemotherapy. Um, and that's not talking about radiation therapy, it's not talking about immune therapy, because those are different kinds of treatments. The inactivated immuno, or influenza vaccine can be administered during treatment, and it probably should be administered during treatment, especially during the, the highest months of um, of influenza during the fall and winter. Now for the live viral vaccines, these are not something that a lot of adults generally need, but you just have to know that you have to talk to the oncologist or infectious disease specialist if you're thinking about giving uh, live viral vaccines if the patient is has recently completed treatment. So in the ideal world, again, four or more weeks before treatment starts or three weeks or more after cancer chemotherapy, but if they've had a stem cell transplant, it has to be 24 months or more after that stem cell transplant. If there's no graft-versus-host disease and if the patient's off immune suppressants, and for any stem cell transplant patient, you really need to be working with that transplant center. Now, some people receive an anti-B cell antibody therapy called rituxan or rituximab, and because it works against specifically anti-B cells, which are the ones that create antibodies, you can see that if you were to give a vaccine to someone who recently gotten rituxan, you may not have a very good response. So they really recommend that you wait at least six months after the rituxan therapy to receive a, um, vaccine. So there is a great article that was recently published that has a list of vaccines that can be given and ones that can't. And is it just exactly what the NCCN is recommending? And that is if it's inactivated, if it's recombinant or a subunit vaccine, it's, it's okay to give it. It's the live ones you have to worry about. So the live attenuated flu mist, no not during treatment, not until afterwards, and then you'd have to wait a little bit. The, the live zoster, no, but there's a new zoster vaccine that's, that's a recombinant one, and I don't know that it's available everywhere yet, but um, the, the recombinant zoster vaccine is okay. The live zoster vaccine, the live uh, varicella vaccine, the MMR, those are ones you don't want to give to somebody during treatment and after treatment, you have to give it that wait time. I think I touched on this already, but for um, hematopoietic stem cell transplant survivors, you need to talk to the transplant team and oncologist because this is a situation where somebody's immune system has been entirely replaced by someone else's immune system. And so their situation is going to be very different. And um, you're, you're definitely going to want to talk to the um, to the specialists before you do any kind of vaccination. Most transplant centers have their own schedule of when you can re-immunize and you know, at what time period 
after transplant, you do what vaccines. And so depending on where they get their transplant, the transplant center will give you, um, or will give the patient a list of vaccines and when they should be done. But just to keep in mind that live viral vaccines are contraindicated if they have active graft versus host disease, or if they have ongoing immunosuppression, and the live viral vaccines, I just listed them out here, the MMR, varicella zoster, the, um, the, the live ones, the oral typhoid, yellow fever by, uh, vaccine, and the rotavirus. So I think this is hard to see, um, and for which I apologize, but um, I did want to talk a little bit about travel vaccines. So patients are usually not traveling during their treatment. They usually travel after their treatment. And at that time, they oftentimes have questions, well, should I get vaccines before I go? So it really depends a lot on all those things that we talked about before, but it also depends about where they're going. If they're just going, for example, to Canada and there's no need for, um, there's no ongoing outbreak there, uh, you may not need to do any kind of vaccine. So you'd want to look at the um, CDC website and see whether there is a, um, any kind of recommendation for the country that the person is going to. So for hepatitis A shot, the, not the immune globulin, but the actual vaccine, if you haven't already had it, um, it's recommended if there is a person is going to a place where hepatitis A is a risk. And if it's a stem cell transplant person, it's um, also recommended that they would get a um, immunoglobulin to help pre uh, prevent against hepatitis A. Um, it could also be somebody who works with hepatitis A in a lab or something like that. For the varicella, there's not much data on the safety or efficacy. Yellow fever, again, there's limited data, and it has to do with the risk-benefit balance. Um, if the person doesn't have a lot of uh, contraindications to a yellow fever vaccine and they're going to a place where there's an outbreak and they have to go there and there's no way around it, then you, you might want to give it if the benefit outweighs the risk. But most of what I read about this was that you should probably try to counsel that person to not go to that area at that time rather than giving a yellow fever vaccine to somebody who might be um, at risk. The rabies vaccine is safe and it's appropriate if there's an exposure or if it's an occupational situation, if it's a vet or something like that. Tick-borne encephalitis and the Japanese bee encephalitis, yes, you can give it um, according to the local policy if it's needed for that traveling, for, if you're traveling to that area. Um, the typhoid bacterial capsule or polysaccharide is okay. That's the typhoid shot. Um, and remember, the typhoid typhoid V is a is one that has the um, uh, the polysaccharide. So uh, some people don't build up a very good immune response to that um, soon after transplant. But it's better than having typhoid because some of the typhoid in the world is um, becoming resistant to antibiotics. So if the question is, give them a shot that may not be 100% effective or take the risk of them getting typhoid and us not being able to treat it, you might tend toward the shot or not, depending. But it's not, um, it's not contraindicated. Um, the oral polio vaccine and the DCG are not recommended. Um, the cholera, rotavirus, and zoster, no data was available. And then for the uh, stem cell transplant, really the uh, things we talked about before, just general contraindications for vaccines for stem cell transplant recipients hold true for travel vaccines as well. Um, and I think it would probably be the wisest thing is just to discuss it with the transplant center or the oncologist if the patient had to travel sometime fairly recently after they completed a stem cell transplant. Okay, so in terms of testing for immunity after cancer treatment, so we don't have as much information about this as would be useful, I think. Um, the most information that I could find had to do with children who'd been treated for cancer, and, and most of them were treated for blood cancers. And so what they did is they, they checked to see whether there were protective antibodies 
uh, titers after the treatment. And they found that they did have protective titers in general for, for some of these vaccines, but it wasn't, it wasn't a strong amount of titer. But the antibody titers did um, recover after a booster for people who had lost that humoral immunity after being treated. And um, they found that the, it was mostly associated with profound lymphopenia, not necessarily neutropenia, which is common, but actual lymphopenia where the B cells aren't being um, made or not floating around in the blood. And it's also linked to longer B cell recovery time. So some of the treatments for um, blood cancers can go over the course of three years. And as you get farther, into that treatment toward the end of the treatment, those um, recovery times get longer. And those are the patients that might actually uh, need to be totally revaccinated. Um, and again, it's, it's, so it's linked to decreases in those plasma cell counts, again, B cells, which make antibodies. If those cells are killed off, you're going to have a decreased um, ability to bounce back after the treatment. And they did find that the younger the patient was, and this is in terms of children, the more persistent the problem was. And so that's why a lot of children need to be fully revaccinated. But for adults, not always. But just something to keep in mind if you have an adult that really had a long involved treatment, um, maybe checking the titers and seeing whether they are adequate and giving a booster if necessary. So the American Society of Clinical Oncology, ASCO, has a wonderful website at cancer.net. They have um, sections on a lot of um, things that are of interest to survivors, um, and these are the sections that they have. For the colorectal, prostate, and breast cancer, they have actually a lot of information. For some of the other kinds of cancer, they don't have as much. It's a very good resource. And then the NCCN also has a website. You do have to register with them um, if you want to get into the nitty gritty. They have these amazing patient um, resource booklets that are, oh, you know, 70 pages long, but you can look at them online. Um, and they talk about specific guidelines. And again, it's a, it's a coalition of 27 of the biggest cancer centers who have collaborated to, to uh, come up with some guidelines and it gives you a really good idea of what the general uh, recommendations are. And they have um, uh, great information about assessment for those late and long-term effects and guidelines for prevention and surveillance. The Children's Oncology Group has a wonderful website at survivorshipguidelines.org. If you've never looked at that, it's wonderful. You can actually download a chart that has um, the information about different late effects associated with different drugs and with different sites of radiation. So for um, the person who had radiation to the chest, it has a place where you can actually look up and see how that relates to late effects. Keep in mind that this is from that cohort of childhood cancer survivors that were treated many years ago who, um, who are maybe adults now, some of them. And it's specific, I think, a little bit to developing bodies who receive these treatments. We just don't have the data as in the same way for adult survivors. Um, but we will. I think that that's coming. But the survivorshipguidelines.org is a great place to start and see what um, kind of links there are to different kinds of drugs and different kinds of late effects. And they have wonderful um, handouts as well, patient education, or if you just want to click on it, things like um, on uh, sexual health and uh, breathing like the, uh, the pulmonary fibrosis, they have a really good one on pi uh, pulmonary um, fibrosis as well. Okay, that's the end of my slides, and feel free to reach out to me. Does, does anybody have any questions right now? Yeah, so we'll open it up for questions. Uh, please feel free to unmute yourself with the microphone icon in the lower left corner of the Zoom window, uh, star six if you're joined by phone, or write in using the chat box. 
Yeah. No questions right now, but feel free to reach out to me if something occurs later. Um, check out those resources. They have a lot more information. I really try to um, keep it as, as concise as possible, and you can um, check those resources to get even more information. Um, Karen, do you have a question? Go ahead. Yeah, I do. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. For someone like me as a patient who's no longer being um, treated by an oncologist, what resources can I give to my uh, primary care physician as well as my specialists um, so that they have the information that they need when determining uh, what course of treatment for me as a long-term survivor? You mean in terms of the vaccines or in terms of just uh, your general health situation? Um, specific to vaccines, um, I have the additional complication of having ulcerative colitis, so I'm on Humira, which without a spleen further compromises my immune system. So, you know, I'm just curious how to, to frame the conversation with them and, and to help them um, determine whether or not I should, for example, get revaccinated for Hep B, which I had many, many years ago, but which the titer shows I have not developed an immunity for. So you had your titers checked, but you weren't revaccinated at that time? Correct. Okay. Um, well, I think it also has to do with um, your, if, if you have any risk factors for hepatitis B, we usually uh, vaccinate people who are at higher risk for hepatitis B uh, as adults. Um, so if you've already been vaccinated and you don't have risk factors, it would, wouldn't would hurt you to get revaccinated for hepatitis B. Um, if, you, if, you, if, your immune, if your immune status is okay, but um, would the benefit be there? Um, you could try a booster with hepatitis B. I don't know whether insurance would pay for it is another complicating factor. In terms of letting your um, doctors know what's right for you, again, it's a conversation between you and your doctor. Once you're out of treatment, the inactivated vaccines like a hepatitis B vaccine is not contraindicated unless you have some other underlying issue going on. So, um, I think that answered your question, but, but inactivated vaccines are safe. And if you don't, if you haven't got positive titers and say you are working in the healthcare field or something like that, where you might be exposed, it's perfectly appropriate to ask to be revaccinated for it, I would think. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks for the question. Any other questions before we wrap up today? Well, this is Bridget, and I wanted to thank Charmian for such a wonderful presentation. Um, it was extremely informative and, and very, very great. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, just real quick, I wanted to let you all know the registration has opened for the Nevada Cancer Control Summit, which will be held on September 16th um, at Whitney Peak here in Reno, Nevada. Um, so please uh, go to our website and you can register online. Um, so please join us for the next clinic um, in this series. It's going to be on April 26th. The topic is going to be on renormalizing healthcare for survivors and primary care providers. Um, it will be presented by Sharon Nagel, who's an oncology patient navigator at Carson Tahoe, and Lisa Thayer, who is a nurse navigator at Carson Tahoe Health. So once again, thank you so much, everyone, and have a fabulous Friday. Thanks, everyone. Hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.